going through this. So I really appreciate the invite. So first of all, we thank everybody for asking me to do this this evening. So what I'm going to walk through is some things that Greg and I put together that are just going to be guidelines uh, for marketing and process considerations as it applies to pasture-fed beef. And, and frankly, a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to apply across the board. Some quick background on myself um, that's relevant to the discussion here tonight. I've actually been at UK since 2000. I've only been on faculty since 2012. But early in my career, I spent about the first, so I was an associate for many years, and I spent the first year and a half, two years, working on a direct and local meat marketing project at UK when I, when I was very young, very young. And that gave me some experience working with producers who were direct marketing, small processors, and even working in, in areas like with, you know, with local chefs and so forth, looking at using products like that. And then I think Greg may mix this yesterday, but he and I worked together and do some finishing and some some marketing, some forage, finished animals ourselves. So those two things, in addition to what I do at UK, have certainly benefited me in terms of uh, some things hopefully I can, I can bring to the table here today. I'm going to start by talking about freezer beef. Um, and the main reason why I want to start there is I think that really is the starting point for a lot of folks. And if you're fairly new to marketing uh, something like forage, finished beef, then freezer beef is a good way to start. It allows you to start small. Slide Slides are slipping. So, some quick thoughts to get us going here. Um, if you, when you think about freezer beef, the first thing I always say is, you want to look at yourself being in a sales and service type role. You're going to spend a lot of time doing communication, logistics. I always underestimate how much time I spend on the phone with a fairly new customer that's buying for the first time phone, text, emails, just helping them understand what's going to happen and how it's going to work. Customers that you sell freezer beef to are customer retail prices, which helps. They're not going to be as sensitive as, say, a, you know, a retailer or a restaurant that's used to buying at wholesale prices. Freezer beef, you're probably going to see lower revenue potential than you would if you were selling at a farmer's market or off the farm retail, but you're not going to spend as much time. So when you, when you take it into account, I think it offers a lot of potential. And you can start small with freezer beef, and frankly, you probably should. It's, it's a way that you can kind of stick, stick a toe in the water and feel how it is before you jump in all the way. Some quick rules of thumb. Um, these are going to vary, but, but some things that we use kind of as ballpark ranges. Dressing percentage, meaning carcass weight as a percent of live weight, somewhere in a ballpark of 52 to 62 percent. Um, that's affected by fat, by gut fill, and so forth. Shrink, we talked about some yesterday. I think Greg even mentioned yesterday in one of the question and answer pieces that, you know, that you know, we've moved towards thinking more in terms of carcass weights anyway and not so much about live weights. The other number I'll talk about some is what I'm going to call meat yield. And there's different, you know, different terms for that. But what I'm really talking about is what percent of the carcass actually becomes take home or what I might call retail meat. And that's going to vary a lot based on cutting methods. So Simple illustration example we'll kind of work through here and kind of carry forward. I'm going to talk about a 1,200 pound finished steer, live weight basis, 60% dressing percentage, so his hanging weight is about 720 pounds. And then I'm going to use a 68% uh, meat yield, which kind of is a ballpark number, and that's going to be 490 pounds of actual meat. And you know, rule of thumb, we like to see our steers do 500 pounds plus of actual meat, depending on the cutting method. There's multiple ways that freezer beef is priced, and I'm going to talk about three of the more common ones, um, and, and we're going to kind of build as we go forward. But there's on the hoof, where I simply price it based on a live weight basis. That's simple and straightforward. We're going to add a little more complexity and talk about pricing on a carcass weight basis. And then the last thing I'll talk about is talking about pricing it based on the actual amount of retail pounds, or what some folks simply call take-home meat. Pricing on the hoof is simple, and, and I want to start by saying there's nothing wrong with pricing this way at all. Um, so you can simply start by thinking, okay, what's my target price per, you know, price per pound on the hoof, and, and I'm going to work off of $1.75 here to kind of get the ball rolling. Understand for you that may be $1.50, that may be $2.50, that's your business, doesn't matter. But whatever that number is what you're comfortable with, we're going to kind of start there. And if that steer weighs 1,200 pounds and you want a dollar 75 for it on the hoof, that's $2,100, and you can you can simply have the customer pay the processor if you so desire. If two customers are splitting that animal, simple enough, they each pay for 600 pounds at a dollar 75, and it works out the exact same. Simple way, it can be done. Nothing wrong with that. 
probably the most common way that freezer beef is priced is priced on a carcass weight basis. And generally speaking, if, if, you, if you use both or if you're thinking about moving from live to carcass, you want to make sure that you can work back and forth. And that's fairly easy to do. Carcass price is simply going to be that live price that you want divided by whatever dressing percentage, whatever dressing percentage you would expect from your cattle. So for example, if that live price target that you want is $1.75, and you feel pretty comfortable that your animals are going to dress 60%, and $1.75 divided by 0 0.60 gives me a $2.92 .92 per pound carcass price. That 720 pound carcass at $2.92 brings me back to $2,100 per head and brings me back to the exact same place I was at $1.75 live weight. And again, in this case, I could simply have the customers pay for the processing. And frankly, in this case, if I know my dressing percentage, I'm indifferent whether I price this at $1.75 on the hoof or $2.92 on a carcass basis. A couple of things to be aware of with carcass pricing. Um, it does eliminate those issues of shrink and gut fill and transportation when they were weighed, and, and that's worth something. If you've got cattle that do dress well, then you can capitalize on that. Maybe most importantly for freezer beef, it makes selling halves and certainly quarters a little bit easier. And the, the smaller quantities we start thinking about moving, the more likely it is you're gonna to wanna to move away from pricing on the hook. It just makes it a little bit easier for your consumers. Um, the next layer of complexity that I wanna add is I wanna talk about how would I go about incorporating processing cost into that price? And again, the further away from the hoof, the more important that becomes. Um, it makes it a bit easier for your customers if they can just pay, you know, write one check to you that includes both the price of the meat and the processing. I will mention this, won't talk about it a whole lot, mention it a little bit later too, but when you do this, there's potential that you do open yourself up to some liability risk just because you're, you know, you're going a step further. One way that some producers have dealt with this is they'll simply price, price it so that it includes the processing, but then have it look as though the processing is offered for free. So it almost looks like that the, the customers uh, doing it on their own. Regardless, I'll talk about a little bit later, but you just want to be aware of that. And you want to probably talk to whoever you get your insurance from about what your options might be if you're concerned about liability. And understand, the further you get away from selling on the hoof, the more you want to think about that as a factor. Now, processing costs are going to vary, and the timing on this is interesting in the sense that, you know, right now we are certainly here in Kentucky, and I suspect in a lot of the states that are listening tonight, we're in a situation where we've got more demand for local processing than we have supply of local processing. So costs have been going up for the last several years, and we're certainly, I think, seeing it right now as we speak. Most of the time, you'll pay a per head kill fee and you'll pay some sort of price per carcass pound basis. So, you know, somewhere in the ballpark, maybe 25 to 60 bucks per head, plus 40 to 75 cents per pound on a carcass basis. For the animals that we typically process, that are gonna be 1,200 plus, that's gonna work out to be over $500 per head for those animals that are killed under USDA inspection. So, simple example, I'm, I'm gonna sell this same steer over and over again here for a little while, but that 1,200 pound steer and the 720 pound carcass, if my processor charges 50 bucks a head and 65 cents a pound carcass weight, that's going to be a $518 cost I'm going to have just in processing alone. Um, there's some potential that custom exempt processors might be a little bit cheaper, but from what I've seen recently, there's been so much demand for processing that I think prices are pretty much up across the board. So you're going to pay a fairly hefty price tag for processing, I think, about no matter no matter where you go for your processing needs. I like to tell producers too, um, you wanna to learn to think about processing cost almost by quantity. So, you know, we've got to talk about on a per animal basis like that 518 bucks, but make it second nature about what it costs you in processing for each half, for each quarter, or really for each quantity that you sell. I'm typically upfront with the folks that I sell freezer beef to and say, you know, you know, you're paying for this quarter, you know, well over $100 of this to simply processing costs. Because I kind of want them to know that that's a good piece of what they actually pay. So if, keeping the math simple, if I just stay with that $518 estimated processing cost, and I think about that 1,200 pound steer, if I wanted to incorporate 
that processing cost into that live animal price, I've got to tack on 43 cents a pound to that $1.75 to incorporate both. So that $1.75 plus the 43 cents, I'm at $2.18 a pound on the hoof to include processing. Similarly, if I want to price on a carcass weight basis, that's forced out to be 72 cents a pound, which spread across a 720 pound carcass. In my $2.92 carcass price, if I want to tack on processing cost, I need about another 72 cents. So that's about $3.64. So all I'm doing is just simply expressing that processing cost on a hoof basis or on a carcass basis and building that back into the price that I need. The last pricing um, approach that I want to talk about here is one that we actually used for a few years. Um, it's where we tried to price based on the amount of meat that customers actually took home. So for example, I've got a 1200, the same 1200 pound steer, 720 pound carcass, and I use that cutout percentage or that meat yield of 68% that I talked about. I've got roughly 490 pounds of sellable meat or take home meat for a consumer. So that's roughly a four, in, in this example, that's a 48, 40.8% final meat yield. I can take that exact same process, take that $1.75 I want on the hoof, divide it by 40.8% or 0 0.408, and I need $4.29 just to get back to that hoof price or value without processing. If I take that $518 and divide it across those number of actual take-home pounds, I need another $1.06 to cover that. So to include processing, I need $5.35 for take-home I'm sorry, per take home pound to bring you back to that $1.75 on the hoof and include processing. Now, I sold this same steer three different ways just so you could kind of compare across the three approaches and see what it might look like. At this point, if I don't think about additional time I may have, I'm indifferent between that steer at $1.75 on the hoof, $2.92 hanging, or the $5.35 here in terms of take home meat. A few things to remember though, if you try and price based on retail meat. The reason that I think we liked it and it worked well early on, it was easy for our customers to understand. Um, it was easy to tell them, you know, you're gonna only pay for the pounds that you actually put in your freezer. And that was nice, they liked that. It has a set of challenges though that make it much less attractive. And frankly, we've moved away from it and moved more towards carcass-based pricing over the last two or three years. For one thing, that meat yield is going to vary greatly based on how the animal is processed. So if you're going to try and price based on take home meat, you want to have a standard cutting approach that you use. Um, you don't want to give your customers free reign to have animals processed however they want because you'll, you know, some will figure this out and they'll, you know, and you really are, you're incentivizing them towards doing more boneless cuts, more burger, things like that. And they'll find a way to, to, um, to come out better because of that. I do want to mention this though, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the challenges of freezer beef, but you know, one of the challenges typically is that folks don't have a lot of freezer space. And by pricing based on um, retail meat or take home meat, it does allow you to move smaller quantities. And you know, we often talk about, talk about halves and quarters but there are folks that like to think about doing a, you know, a mixed 50 pound package of meat or something like that. And you can use this pricing approach for that. And the nice thing about having some smaller packages there, you may open up to some customers that don't have deep freezes and are going to be using just, you know, standard um, fridge freezer combo. And sometimes you can get those folks that start with a small quantity and make them a quarter or a half customer down the road. So I, I don't want you to discount this completely, but just understand it definitely has its pitfalls. And, and definitely get some advice on the liability side from your insurance professional in doing that. Here's just some ranges we're gonna kind of throw out for a second. Um, there's, there's always variation in dress percentage and cutout percentage. It's probably even more variable though for grass-fed cattle Range that we oftentimes hear quoted for grain finished cattle, progress percentage is between 60 and 64%. You know, you can probably think about the lower end of that going much lower for grass fed cattle, somewhere in kind of the 53 to 64% range. Cut out for grain finished cattle might be 67 to 73%, probably more like 64 to 73 for grass fed cattle. 
And when you put those two things together, um, final meat yield is also going to be more variable and maybe even a bit lower on average for cattle that are finished on grass. But again, this depends on how the animals are finished and depends on how that they're processed. So you know, you'll, you'll kind of develop this for your, your system as you go along. Wrapping up some of my thoughts on freezer beef here, um, you really want to consider the logistical, the time, the organization when you, when you do your pricing. More often than not, I think people tend to underprice freezer, freezer beef than overprice. And I always like to remind folks, you can always lower your price. It's much harder to raise it. And especially if you start small, finishing a few steers or heifers here and there, you probably can command a pretty good price for those small numbers. And then as you grow, you may have to lower your price. So don't underestimate the additional time that it's going to take beyond what you might be selling if you're wholesaling or selling in some other manner. I kind of just assumed that I was moving either whole animals or sides thus far, but you know, generally speaking, you're going to be moving some halves, some quarters, maybe even some smaller packages if you're doing bulk. And you're probably going to want to think about charging more for smaller quantities. Most processors, most processors will only sort to the tune that they will, they will, they will process a side and leave it at that. Very few will sort into quarters or smaller packages. So if that's the case and you're moving quarters, and, and when we say quarter, we typically mean split half, you're gonna have to be the one to split that half into two quarters. So that's gonna take some additional time and you're gonna have to charge some more for that. Also, I would tell you this, be very clear about pickup and delivery expectations. Um, a lot of folks that you may sell freezer beef to may just assume you're gonna deliver it, but I can just tell you that it'll run you to death at times. So, be clear about expectations. Generally, we like for customers that are getting a side to pick it up on their own, with some exceptions, of course. If we're doing quarters, oftentimes we do the sorting. We'll try and arrange them to actually meet us at, you know, maybe where I live or some other location and pick up there. We don't try to try to we don't try and we try not to deliver as much as we can because it just takes a lot of time. Anytime you're moving freezer beef or processing in any manner for whatever the market is. Um, the role of the processor is crucial, but I think it's especially crucial for freezer beef sales for a lot of reasons. I'm gonna cover kind of some high level thoughts um, based on what I know about processors and kind of some of our experience, but we generally interact with two types of meat processors, USDA inspected facilities and custom exempt facilities. Now I'm aware there's several states here. Some of you in your home state may have a state inspection service. And my understanding is that state inspection allows those folks to sell within the state. We don't have that in Kentucky. We're either USDA or custom exempt. A USDA inspected plant has a USDA inspector that's present regularly. Um, they're not there all the time, but they're in and out. But what you want to understand is that under USDA inspection, Animals processed that way can be sold pretty much any way that you want provided they're labeled accordingly. I can sell it as freezer beef, I can sell it to restaurants, I can retail it off the farm, farmer's market, you name it, I can do it if it's been inspected and has an appropriate label with that seal on there. You wanna think of custom exempt plants as those that provide a custom service for the end user of the meat, okay? They do not allow you to take meat to them, have it processed, and then resell it. But they can be used for direct marketing. And the way you want to think about them is that you sell a live animal to your customer, and the customer pays the processor. The custom exempt plan is providing a custom service for the end user of the meat itself, your customer, not you. That's the best way to think about it. So the trick there is you want to sell the animals on the hoof, and then the, the, uh, the processor is interacting with your customer. Processors provide a lot, an awful lot of, um, of they, they serve a lot of roles in the process. So obviously they provide slaughter and processing services. And the fact that most of our small processors can do so on a custom basis is a real advantage. Your customers can pick and choose how they want the animal processed if they buy a side of their own. You know, they're, they're gonna, you're, you're gonna basically outsource the handling of your animals once they get there to them. And you know the way that they're handled can impact you know how they actually do. They're on the rail, sanitation, you know cleanliness. Those kind of things certainly matter in terms of quality and food safety and things like that. 
they're going to provide labeling services. You know, they're going to be the ones that are going to be aging the carcasses. You know, one thing we don't talk about much yet, I don't think, is that, you know, a lot of our local processors can age, can age carcasses on the rail for, you know, two weeks or more, right? And that's something that you're not going to get at the grocery store from mainstream meat market, and that can be a real selling point for you. Packaging is just so, so important, and I, I really didn't know this until we started moving some freezer beef, but we had an opportunity last year, we had some extra burger that we actually did retail on our own with a small amount of it. And I had one gentleman who actually bought some from me. He was a neighbor that, that lives not too far from me. And I, I think he bought 20 pounds of ground beef. As soon as I opened the freezer and he saw how it was packaged, you know, vacuum sealed and looked good, he said, man, that looks great. And, and, and he's buying a quarter this year from us. So first impressions are very important and that applies not just to what they encounter at the processor, but also how the meat looks when they see it for the very first time. Um, and just understand in general that they're gonna be a major contact point for your customers. So, you know, what your customers see when they get there is gonna leave a pretty important impression. If, if something looks like a red flag to you, understand you're probably more tolerant of those kind of things than your customers are. And if they're going to be picking up meat on their own, you want to think about what are they going to see when they walk through the door. If your processor has an employee that's not pleasant to work with and they're at the front desk and they're who your customers encounter, that can be a problem. Oftentimes someone that even if they get a half and pick it up, if I can meet them there the first time a day that I'm sorting or something, I like to be there just to walk through the process. Because sometimes, sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating for a new customer as they're interacting with the processor. But understand how crucial a role that processor is in this entire system. When you're considering a processor or what processor to use, there's several things you want to think about. And I say this a bit tongue in cheek because frankly, most of us don't have a plethora of options to pick from here. We talked about cost a little bit already. Cost is going to be very important. You know, but frankly, you're, you're probably not going to have half a dozen plants to pick from within an hour of you. So you've kind of got to take some of this as best you can. You definitely want to think about distance. Um, distance matters in terms of delivering live animals, but it matters just as much, maybe even more, when you start thinking about where your customers pick up their meat and then where you have to go to pick it up and do any sorting that might exist. So, so think about distance in terms of the cost and time that it actually takes. It makes a big difference for sure. The quality of the job that they do, how dependable they are, and how responsive they are. You know, um, oftentimes when it gets really close to time they to be processed, Decisions have to be made and communication to be made very quickly. And the quicker they can get back to you and your customers, the better and make everybody happy. You want to ask too about what types of bio-added processing that they do. Um, many will do burger patties, brats, curing, they might do some smoking. So ask about things like that. They may have some value to your customers and may be a way to kind of enhance some of your selling. Finally, you want to ask the question about what sorting they do. Most processors only will process a half. And then if you want to go to a quarter, you have to do it yourself. Ask the question, though. If you've got a processor that, that will do some additional sorting for you, it can save you some time and maybe worth a little bit more for you. Given how backed up most processors are right now, I, I don't think that's very likely. But down the road, it's very possible. I'm seeing something you may want to think about. You will encounter some challenges, and we've encountered, I think, about all of these over the last several years. You know, right now is the perfect example of how scheduling can be a problem because these processes are backed up so far in advance. Um, you know, typically our processes were running two to three months out already, and now we've got processors booking, booking cattle into spring of 2021. So scheduling is always a challenge. Processing dates can sometimes be fluid. Um, you know, we've delivered cattle. And then, you know, thought to be processed around two weeks later, and then it's three weeks, and then it's four. And, and you know, that, that can be frustrating when you're trying to make plans for pickup. And then sometimes you get kind of squeezed on the back end, too, where, you know, your, your processing date gets backed up, you know, five, six, seven days beyond what you expect. And then when they process, they say, okay, now we're going to process on Wednesday. You have to pick it by Friday. So, you know, you've kind of got to expect some, some, some frustration there at times, and, and those can be very difficult to deal with. It's very common to have some. Um, it's very common to have some errors in the way the meat is processed. Sometimes these are minor. You know, something gets ground that wasn't supposed to be ground, or something. You know, you know, something was cut differently or different thickness. So sometimes it's minor. And I always tell my customers that you know they they do a good job. They don't bat a thousand, so they don't expect perfection. 
But do be aware of that. You know, some things are minor, but if you've got somebody that wants an inch and a quarter stakes and they get half an inch stakes, that's going to be a big problem. So you've kind of got to think ahead about how you might deal with some of those things. Quality certainly matters. Packaging matters. Um, I always tell customers, if they're first time customers, go through, you know, all your packages and feel them. You know, the ones that feel loose and aren't sealed well, they're fine, but put those on top and use those first. They probably won't last quite as long as the others in terms of quality. We've also learned this, you know, you'll have customers that'll want, you know, liver, some may want kidneys, hearts, what have you. Just don't promise organs. Um, we probably get only about one out of every three or four um, livers that we ask for. Um, our, our, our processor has told us that the, the inspectors are very picky about livers in particular. So just don't promise organs. I always say, well, we'll request them, but we can't promise them. I'm not gonna talk a great deal about labeling, um, but I do wanna hit some of the high points here. So if you plan to you know, resell your meat in any fashion, um, when it leaves that door, it's got to be labeled. And it's gonna have an inspection seal and numerous other things on it. Most all processors will have some type of generic label that you can use that'll have their inspection seal, you know, their, their, their facility, you know, what it is, weight, and so forth. So ask the question, but I'd be shocked if they didn't. Generally speaking, if you want to design a very simple label of your own, you know, you can have those printed. The on-site inspector can approve those. If it's something as simple as your farm name and a simple logo, they can approve those and actually put them on right there for you if your processor is okay with that. Um, if you get beyond something simple, you may have to have that approved. I mentioned early in my career, I worked on a direct meat marketing project and I had a producer that was doing some country hams. And he had done just this. He had made some labels with just his farm name and this was unbeknownst to me, but he had put his, he had actually put his town, his location on there. Um, so the city and state. And I was surprised by this, but the inspector on site said that she couldn't approve it because it was an origin claim. So we actually had to go through the sketch approval process, but it was fairly simple. Um, we mailed in a sketch. We actually sent in one of the labels. Within two weeks, they'd gotten back to us and, and we had approval on it. We put it in a file folder. The processor kept it there on file at the office and we were fine. Um, if, you've, if you've got more complex needs, there are label expediters that can be hired to do these types of things or walk you through these and save you some time. So be aware that they're out there. Most importantly, I would say this, um, understand that USDA is very particular about what can and cannot be on labels. A lot of the terms that you and I may use when we kind of talk generically amongst ourselves may have a specific label and may have a specific meaning when it's on a label. You know, someone, I think Ed talked about organic a little bit already. You know, you know what organic means to be certified organic. You know, the word lean is a labeling claim. And some things like that, you simply cannot put on a label without going through a verification process and having people to do that. So just be aware of that. Um, if you want to get into something more involved, I definitely want to push you towards using an expediter or some type to walk you through that process. New customers will ask a lot of questions and understand that that's just how this has to start. Um, they're going to know what it's going to cost. We actually have a flyer we use that kind of talks through how our pricing works and kind of tries to answer some of those questions that they're still going to want to talk to you about it. We're going to ask when we'll be ready. So you'll explain the aging process and the time and how it's kind of out of your control and when you think you'll get it. You know, I, I usually give folks kind of a, you know, a one week window kind of as a ballpark, ballpark estimate. We're going to ask how much meat that they can, that they'll get from the carcass. Um, and this is going to vary, obviously. And, you know, you explain that to them. There are some rough rules of thumb out there that I've heard, like, you know, one-third burger, one-third steak, one-third roast. But those, those are not good estimates, in my opinion. What I've done is just simply kind of kept track of a few in the past. And then I can simply say, okay, you know, it's going to vary. But here's, here's an example of a steer that we sold, you know, two years ago. And here's what they got of every single cut. And, and sometimes that makes them a little bit more comfortable with what they're doing. And, and then understand that they have some control of that if they, if they, if they buy a side. Um, also, some won't think about this, but you want to ask them, do you have a deep freeze? Because some may just not even think about that. And deep freezers are getting hard to come by right now, for sure. They're going to ask you, though, if they have a deep freeze, how much freezer space they need. And you want to have an idea of that. For example, I have a six and a half cubic foot freezer. I cannot get a half a beef in my freezer. I can get a quarter and about another eighth. So I kind of use that to kind of calibrate how much freezer space folks are going to need. But you have to be able to answer kind of those basic questions that you and I probably take for granted. Um, 
In terms of freezer beef challenges, before I shift gears here, you know, processing costs are a challenge. You know, you're, you're going to pay probably close to three times what, what the cost is going to be for a large meat packer, and that's okay. That's because of scale and offall challenges and multiple other reasons. But, you know, I, I don't really believe in trying to sell based on price. You know, if you're moving high-quality product, I try to sell based on quality and what you've got to offer, not so much that it's cheaper. So I'm just upfront about that. You know, most folks are going to have limited freezer space. And I've heard of people that will do things like trying to incorporate the cost of a freezer, you know, into their freezer beef, or they might incorporate a third of the freezer, and then after three halves, it's yours or something like that. So you can be creative, but understand that's going to be a hurdle for you to deal with. You know, for a lot of folks, it's a lot of money up front. You, you know, you're talking about, you know, depending on how much you're getting between, you know, 500 and $1,500 for a lot of folks up front. And so, you know, some folks do things like payment plans. You know, there's obviously a risk there of collection, but, you know, think about how you might get around some of that down the road. We do ask for a deposit for new customers um, to deal with the outlay issues. And then we don't let them pick up the meat until it's paid in full. It's kind of our process. And we like to have, we like to have the, um, the, the down payment, if you will, because sometimes you'll have folks that'll try to, that'll commit and then back out and that creates challenges. Um, talk a few minutes about selling retail. This can take a lot of different forms, but you know, this is kind of a farmer's market setting. Looks like the retail is kind of there in the middle. If you kind of look over to the left, there's somebody maybe doing some cooking there for some sampling, fairly straightforward. This is either a picture of a farmer's market set up or perhaps a, uh, some sort of on-farm retail system where you've got prices listed. But, you know, if, if you're moving retail cuts, whether it be through farmer's market, you know, some sort of on-the-farm store or online outlet, or even if you're selling to restaurants, you're going to have to use a federal inspected processor. You're going to have to have that labeled. And you're going to have to have a patience and a willingness to work with customers. And, um, and that can, that can not, that's not always easy to do, especially with a handful of folks that are out there. You really want to think about all your marketing costs here. And, you know, your time being a big one, transportation cost, you know, storage matters. If you sell at farmer's market, you've got to have storage both to keep meat, you know, that you're going to sell down the road and also storage somehow there at the farmer's market to sell. So think about that. But if you're at a farmer's market or on, on farm retail, you know, you're probably going to want to do some sampling. You got to deal with some of the cost. You got to deal with the cost of the samples and some of the spoils that goes with that. Farmers markets are a growing market. Um, there's been an explosion in the last 20 years of farmers markets. And I think generally speaking, they're becoming more and more um, friendly to meat sales. In most cases, the local health department kind of has jurisdiction over those. So you don't want to kind of check on how that works. But for the most part, you know, if you've got, you know, freezer set up, refrigerator, you know, sometimes even coolers, you know, you can, you can do that just fine. Customers usually aren't really price sensitive. They're there because they want, you know, to, they're looking for products like the type that you're selling and you've got to have it labeled, of course. You know, you're competing against people at the farmer's market that sell similar products, but the nice thing about it, the market itself kind of brings the customers to you, which, which is worth quite a bit. The other more common retail experience is when I've got some sort of on-farm retail. And oftentimes it's incorporated with agritourism. You know, you, you've got to find a way to get folks out to the farm. And, you know, in some cases that's really easy. In some cases it's not. So this may, not be, it may or may not be an option for some of you out there. Similar to farmer's markets though, if folks come to the farm to buy, they're probably not going to be super priced as if that's a good thing. Got to have it labeled. Um, I would encourage you to think about if you have an on-farm retail, you know, you probably don't want to be constantly having to stop what you're doing and go sell meat. Um, so you may want to think about setting, you know, a couple of days a week, a few, you know, set hours, you can kind of do that. I can only imagine how distracting that would be in some settings if you're having to stop three or four times a day and go sell meat if you're in the middle of something on the farm. Um, don't underestimate, though, the significance of trying to get folks to come out to the farm. There's always been some studies that have been done on, you know, local product and just, you know, basically any kind of value-added product. And they tend to fall in two categories. They'll tend to be hypothetical based, right? Which has its own uh, potential for, um, for flaws. But even the ones that where they're kind of simulating, a, they're kind of simulating a store environment, oftentimes those studies are done in such a manner that it almost assumes that, you know, the, the grass fed product and the, you know, the, 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 the mainstream part are side by side in the meat case. And oftentimes they're not. 
and understand someone may be willing to pay another dollar to a pound very easily for the type of product that you sell, that doesn't mean they're going to drive 20, 30 minutes out of their way to come get, you know, five or 10 pounds at a time. So just understand that an extra stop means extra cost. You got to think about that being a, you know, a potential barrier to on-farm retail. CSAs are largely something that we see in the produce arena, um, like a subscription service. It's really kind of a risk sharing service where, where customers buy a share of farm output. So it makes a lot, it, it, it seems to fit better with, with fruit and vegetable type folks. It would require a pretty market savvy, market savvy person to do this for meat. But one idea that Greg and I had, we were kind of thinking about what to talk about this evening is that, you know, one way to do this would be to try and partner with someone that has a produce CSA and then, you know, kind of offer their customers a chance to kind of tap into their meat side that you might be able to offer. So think about that down the road. Some of you may be able to do that on your own. This is something to think about that. That's a growing market as well. I think one of the real questions to ask in terms of retailing is, can you get folks to come to you or do you need to go to them? And if you've got a farm location or if you've got an agricultural where you can get folks out to the farm and our farm retail might be fine. If not though, farmer's markets I think are definitely worth a look. And although you're gonna pay something in terms of setup fees and probably membership fees, they're gonna do a lot of the marketing for you and get the folks there. So don't, don't discount those. You want to think about the price points that your location will support. You know, we're all different. Um, so you want to think about, you know, how much willingness to pay is there in your area for the type of meat that you're going to be selling. Um, last point I'll make here on retail sales, and, and this is not something to just brush by and ignore, but one nice thing about freezer beef and selling sides and quarters is you will inevitably move animals in proportion to carcass. So, you know, you'll kind of be moving in whole animal quantities. If you go pricing retail, you, you're going to have to learn to set prices in such a way that you're not left with a whole bunch of roast or a whole bunch of burger at the end of the day. And that takes some practice. But I remember early in my career talking to some folks and, you know, and they were, in this particular case, they were having trouble moving. Um, they were having trouble moving. I think it was roast. And they kept saying, I can move my steaks and I can move my burger. I can't move my roast. And, you know, the truth is there's not a magic bullet here. You know, you've got two options. You can lower the price of the roast or you can raise the price of the steaks and the burgers in the short run, right? In the long run, we have to sometimes ask ourselves, well, if my burger market is good enough, do I just simply want to grind more of that meat that's going into roast and put in more in the burger? So, you know, you kind of got to think about those sort of things. But ultimately, you've almost got to price it such that it moves in proportion to the carcass itself. I'm going to end the discussion talking about some wholesale opportunities and these potentially are going to be higher volume opportunities, but I think they're also have, you know, both good and bad to kind of talk through here quickly. So when we define the way that we're kind of going to define wholesale opportunities are going to be selling live animals in bulk, typically on the hoof or by carcass weight. So an aggregator of some type like Hickory Nut Gap, um, some processors may have a retail or wholesale market. Maybe they have a storefront of some type where they can actually move some product through. A really good situation is you've got a processor that does your custom work for you, for your customers, but they also have an on-farm, I'm sorry, they also have a retail front and maybe they like the kind of cattle you produce. And then you, know, you can unload six or seven steers there, three are for freezer beef and three or four for them. And you know, that, that, that's probably an ideal scenario for some of you to kind of save on transportation costs and so forth. You know, th there may be some other potential of someone that does some direct marketing that you can sell to. Um, the nice thing about these wholesale type opportunities are they tend to be lower marketing costs. You're not going to spend as much time, you know, on a per head basis. Now you probably are not going to make quite as much per head, but I think having those there in terms of volume are very nice. I would also point this out that even if wholesale isn't as attractive on a per head return basis, they can be a great complement to direct sales. You know, for example, we have to plan so far out for freezer beef that having a backup wholesale market for some of those animals can really give us the flexibility that we need to push the freezer beef harder. Maybe I can go ahead and finish, you know, 15 or 20 freezer beef if I want to, if I know I can sell 10 or 15 if I need through through a wholesale outlet, then I can push the freezer beef pretty hard. So think about the two complementing each other because oftentimes they will do just that. Um, early in my career when I was working on the direct marketing stuff, I would get a lot of questions about selling to restaurants. Um, first of all, understand it's going to be very difficult to get that direct to consumer return 
when we sell to restaurants because those folks are used to buying at wholesale price. So the price point they're accustomed to is much different. Um, so you're going to have to find restaurants that are willing to pay for quality and pay for what you're going to need to make it worth your time. Generally speaking, um, upper end restaurants are a good market for high end steaks. And I think in a lot of cases, burger as well. They tend to be more difficult markets for lower end steaks and roasts. So some of those, you know, steaks and roasts that are less, less common are certainly going to be harder for you to move through restaurant markets. The other thing to remember is that when you go calling on restaurants, they're accustomed to being called on by professional salespeople, by wholesalers. So that's kind of what they're going to expect. So oftentimes you're going to get your foot in the door by finding out who the head chef is, stopping by at a time when they're not as busy, usually before lunch or between lunch and supper, and taking them some samples for them personally. So look, here's a couple of steaks, here's a couple, a couple of pounds of burger. Take these home, try them, see what you think. I'd love to talk to you about trying to sell you some in your restaurant and just start there. And then I always used to also tell folks, you want to, each time you see them, you want to try and make an appointment to follow back up. Could I come back in two weeks and see how you like this? And then when you come back in two weeks, say, would you like to try so many pounds of this? And you're always trying to get a commitment each time you're there. And if you get it, you keep pushing. And if they push away, you find move to the next one. But kind of think about it that way. Just understand they're used to being called on by sales professionals. They're going to expect a little bit more in terms of how you interact with them. My final thoughts here, and we'll open up to questions, I guess, for, for both Ed, I, and the rest of the panelists, but when you think about marketing, especially if you're fairly new to direct marketing, it's fine to start small. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, may think, you know, finishing 10 or 12 head of cattle is not much, but I can tell you moving 10 or 12 head with a freezer beef is a lot to move right off the bat. So it's okay to start small. You're much better off, in my opinion, to have more demand than supply early on and have a waiting list for the next year. You don't want to be trying to scramble and move, you know, five or 10 finished steers. You have nowhere to go, especially in a place like Kentucky where there's no market for finished cattle to speak of. Um, you've got to be a good planner. And you heard Greg the other night talk about um, ages of cattle for the most part that are truly finished on grass. Those of you that have a cow herd that are finishing your calves, you know how long a time we're talking about you're buying calves like we do and finishing those cattle it's still a long time horizon so you've got to plan really far ahead so just get in get in the habit of thinking you know one and a half two years out sometimes be flexible and expect things to change you know there's almost always surprises and you just kind of learn to roll with the bunches and then last thing i'll say is this um again that i think it's this before but the further you get away from selling on the hoof the more potential you've got to start needing to think about liability. And I would encourage you to start, start with your existing farm policy. It may or may not cover some things beyond the farm gate. You just need to ask. Be upfront about what you're doing with your agent and say, you know, what are my options here? And then talk with them about, you know, what are some things that I can do in terms of how I market these cattle that might help me some on the other side as well. But I think you're better off to be upfront about those things and just kind of assume that you're covered if, if, if you're not. So I would encourage you to have that conversation. This is my contact info. Reach out to me anytime. I'm really good about getting back with you. If, if you call the office, leave me a message. I'm not there a whole lot right now. working from home most of the time. I can almost always respond an email within about 24 hours. If you're on Twitter, I'm at KY Cattle Econ. The picture on the right, I'll talk about just a quick second. So when John was giving his talk um, last night, I heard him use, I heard him make a statement about Johnson grass and said, you either learn, learn to deal with it or learn to love it. And this picture of me was taken in August of 2018. And it was, I think, the middle of August. And of course, I was so tickled about how good that pasture looked that time of year. It's very unusual. What you're seeing there, though, in front of me, obviously, is Johnson grass. And I, I know I speak for Greg and I both when I say we have learned to love it. And, you know, one of my favorite things to do is turn cattle into a pasture with a lot of Johnson grass because they go straight to it and they just start stripping it. And, and I enjoy watching them do that. So, Again, I want to thank everyone. I want to say, first off, thanks for the invite. I enjoyed visiting with everybody tonight, and I'm looking forward to some discussion here now that we're done.